Hey guys, welcome back. So this is part two on the 7,000 watt NAC generator. You know, part one was spent mostly triaging this unit. I had no information on it. And the reason for that was because someone had thrown this away. So I had assumed it had a bad power head or a bad engine. And midway through the first part on this video, I got the engine to run and it sounds great and the power came right on. So those two items are kind of the most critical things. If either one of those didn't work, then this generator would not be viable to fix. Anyway, once it was running, I could see there were a number of other issues, some of which I fixed in part one. So if you wanna see that, I'll link to it in the description and up above. But you know, I kinda ran out of time on that video and we still had a few things left to fix. The majority of them are in this control panel here, which is very hard to access when it's on the machine. So I'm gonna get you set up a little bit better. We'll disconnect all the wiring, get that up on the bench and see if we can't make it perfect. So this panel has a few issues. I guess first off, and probably most important, is the outlets on the front. The one on the right is currently tripped and won't reset. So I did pick up a new 20 amp GFCI outlet. We'll swap that out. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna swap this one as well. This one works, but you can tell it was replaced at one point with one that doesn't quite match. And I think more importantly, it's a 15 amp outlet in a spot where it should be 20 amps. So while I'm in there, we'll swap that one out as well. Uh, the hole that's right here is supposed to be a green light, just indicating that the power is on. Not a big deal, but the lens broke and the light fell in. So I checked eBay real quick and found a replacement for three bucks. So I'll throw that in while I'm in there. And lastly, I think we have a bad bridge rectifier. You can't see it because it's inside the box on the back, but that powers the idle control, which isn't working. And I believe from the testing I did in the first video that I proved that that bridge rectifier in there is bad. So I got a new one of those. We'll swap that out. And then this control panel should be good to bolt back on to that generator.
That took longer than I probably made it look. I'd say well over an hour to do it right. Anyway, they're installed and I think we're good. Now this down here is the bridge rectifier that I suspect is bad and I actually can smell an electrical smell when I open this box up and it seems to be coming from here. So I'm hoping that that is it. Uh, this here is the idle control and that also has a slight burnt electrical smell. So this and this were in close proximity, but this smells worse. So hoping that that's it. Anyway, one thing I just want to point out, this is a brushless generator and in the generator head, there is no capacitors. Uh, they're actually up here. There's two of them. They're 20 microfarad wired in parallel. So if you have one of these, and it's not making power or the output is low, find and test these capacitors. That is the most common point of failure. There's not much to replacing this pilot light. This runs on 120 volts and it's a direct replacement for the one that was in there. So I'm just gonna install that like so. We'll tighten it down, splice in the wires and move on to that bridge rectifier. The first video, I kind of crudely determined that this was bad, but now that it's out, I want to do a little bit more testing. So put the multimeter into diode check. And the way you want to do this is find the positive and negative leads, which are right here. You want to put one probe on the positive and then test on each of the AC inputs. You can see we get a voltage drop there, 0.48. And 0.48 so that's good if we reverse these leads if the diodes are working we should not see a voltage drop anymore and we don't so we're good on the positive side let's check the negative we 
get a voltage drop, 0.49. We'll check the other AC input. And we get zero. So that, that seems to be a dead short. So that is our issue. One of the diodes is bad, but let's just flip this around and double check. Yep, zero. And no voltage drop. So yeah, there's one bad diode in this bridge rectifier. The part I'm replacing this with is not exactly the same. I mean, it is a full bridge rectifier, but you can see the form factor is quite a bit different. Now this one was available. It was about $30. And then there was this one on Amazon, pack of 10 for basically a dollar each. So I bought that pack of 10 and this should work just fine. But because it's a different form factor, it's not really gonna fit in the original location too well. And there's not much room to spare. So I'm gonna move some wires around. I'm gonna relocate this most likely right about there. It'll still be protected from the elements. I mean, this is potted anyway, so it won't matter too much, but it'll just make it a lot easier to work with. So I'm gonna cut some wires out for that bridge rectifier, relocate them to the outside, and then we'll just start buttoning things back up and we'll get this thing reinstalled. This green wire I added is going to be the neutral for the bridge rectifier. It's going to get connected right to there, which is a good ground. A shrink tubing I used was a little bit too big. It's not quite hugging the wire, but really didn't have much of a choice. I had to use one that would fit onto this connector. So I'm gonna add just a bit of electrical tape right here, 
Really, I'm just trying to make it a little bit more waterproof. And also, if the wire should pull out, I want to have something here kind of holding it in so we don't end up with a hot wire dangling around. Granted, this is only 12 volts, but I'd rather be safe.
As far as the coil goes, I got a new one. It's here on the right. So we'll double check that one in a minute. And for those who missed it in the first video, the coil that was on there was running the engine, but it was shutting down. And I think partially due to a bad oil module, I might retest this later, but ultimately it ended up being the cap on the plug itself. You know, this coil is the original coil. It should be between six and 7,000 ohms. And when I test it directly, that's what we get. It's six, 0.5 thousand ohms. So this is a good coil. The cap itself does have about 4,000 ohms resistance. And this one was high when I tested it. It was at about 100,000 ohms. And now it's open circuit. So definitely an issue, potentially the issue, which led to this generator being thrown away. Uh, this coil here, we'll just double check it. With this boot on, we should get about 10,000 ohms, somewhere between 10 and 11. And we're at 10.2 thousand ohms. So this coil should be fine. Just going to use a cut up business card as a spacer. So right now the coil is pulled all the way back. We'll slide this in, rotate the magnet underneath and just loosen these bolts and let the magnets pull it tight. And then we'll snug up these bolts here to hold the coil, but don't overdo it. They do strip out pretty easy. And rotate the engine at least once around. Make sure the magnet is not dragging anywhere on that flywheel. If it is, you might have to actually adjust the coil again, you know, on that high spot, which does happen sometimes. But in this case, we're good.
Although there's nothing wrong with this air box, this engine cleaned up really well, and I hate to just put it back on. It is pretty crusty. So I do have another one. I actually got it for another project and didn't need it. But I mean, regardless, they're about $20 on eBay. So not a big investment to make it look quite a bit better. Overall, this thing's coming out pretty good, at least compared to where we started. I mean, this actually looks like a respectable machine at this point from most angles. I mean, it has been used quite a bit, but I'd say it looks a million times better. Anyway, I'm tempted to just put the stator cover on as well as the battery strap, but I'd say this side of the generator is a bit more crusty than the rest. I mean, the battery tray is rusted out pretty bad as well as the feet as well as these two items so I think I'm going to clean these up a bit just freshen these up a little you know I don't want to go crazy you know I'm not looking to paint the whole thing this is a pretty used machine but I can make it a bit better The plan was just to paint the bottom, but now that it's off, I can see we have bigger issues. We got a bunch of rot and it's full of dirt. So I don't think this is worth saving, but I do have these. Got two of them. They're actually from a dog bed and dimensionally, they're about the same, slightly shorter, 
but I think that would be a better replacement. So I've already removed the grip from this one and it fits on here well. I also have these plugs here to cap the bottom. So let me show you how I got the grip off, which is pretty difficult. Like I can't get it to budge like this, but if you add a little bit of air in the right spot, it helps it slide right off. Like that. I think I'm gonna do the easy thing here and let this soak in evaporust for a few days. Hmm, maybe in a different container. What do you think? It's been about 24 hours and we're making pretty good progress. This end cover looks like it's almost done. Let's check the rest. Battery tray could use a little bit more. And the battery strap doesn't look half bad, at least on this side, but it does still need some more. So. I let this soak for another 24 hours, and at that point, I think we should be ready to throw some paint on it. Okay, we're at the 48 hour mark. Let's see what it looks like. And cover looks good. I think that's pretty good. And the battery strap. So they're in pretty good shape. I'm just gonna rinse these off, probably hit it with some sandpaper and then clean it with some alcohol and throw some paint on it. Stuff came out a lot better than I thought. Kind of went from one of the worst looking parts on the entire machine to probably the best.
This might be a little bit sketchy. I'm not sure. But this tray has a lip right here, which keeps the battery from sliding any further that way. And originally, this tray was the other way around, so the lip was here, and was actually pushing the battery right against the stator. And this is the air intake for the stator. You don't want to block that. So I assume that it should be like this. I mean, it kind of makes sense because this battery tie should be kind of pulling the battery toward that lip. And when it was the other way, it wasn't really doing that. So I think I'm going to work at this a bit more. I really want to get that where it belongs and leave that tray in this orientation to provide enough cooling. Well, I clearly made a mistake here because although the power was on after I reset the first outlet, I couldn't get the second one to come on. And then when I moved back to the first, the power had gone out and the engine did on a couple occasions sound like it went under load. So something happened. We need to get this back inside and figure out what changed. Back here again. And, you know, I never tested the power head. You know, in the first video, was spent mostly focused on the engine, getting it to run. And once it did, I could see that it made power. So I didn't really question it. And in this video, most of the time was spent fixing the control box and getting that squared away. But now it looks like we have an issue with the power head itself or potentially I wired something wrong. So I guess we can check that first. You know, these wires here are the ones that run up to the control box. Uh, these two black ones go to the capacitors. I don't need to test those at the moment. I'm going to test everything else first, and if I don't find a problem, then I'll make sure those are discharged and we can see what the capacity is on those. So that just leaves these two connectors, which are leg one and leg two. 
Now, up in the control box, I saw all these colors up there. Brown was connected to the hut on one of the 120 outlets I replaced, and blue was the other hut on the other outlet. So that makes sense. And the yellow and the white are the neutrals. So I want to make sure I didn't wire anything to create a short circuit. And the way I can test that is just to put a lead on this hut brown wire, which goes up to the outlets, and then just check it to all the other wires. There should be absolutely no connection. So there's nothing there on the yellow. We'll check the blue. No connection. We'll check the white wire coming down, which is neutral. No connection. And the ground wire. No connection. So we'll do the same test here on the yellow, which is the neutral, for leg one. And we should get a connection actually on the neutral coming down. So let's check that. And we do, 0.2 ohms. We'll check the ground, nothing, that's fine. And we'll check leg two, no connection. So we're good on leg one. Uh, for leg two, we'll just check this hot wire Check it to leg one, hot wire, nothing. Leg one, neutral, nothing. Neutral, I guess for leg two, and ground. So that is good. Nothing is short-circuited up in the control panel, which makes sense because the circuit breaker would have popped on the front of that unit, and it didn't. So I think we're good in the control panel. So that just leaves the coils themselves. Uh, this one here is the excitation winding, which feeds the capacitors. We got leg one and leg two. We'll start with this one. Usually it's between one and one and a half ohms. We're at 0.5, so that's a bit low. Let's check it to ground. We're fine. Check leg two, usually between 0.3 and 0.5 ohms. 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that's fine. We'll check it to ground. Good there. We'll check leg two. 0 0.3 ohms, that's good. Check it to ground. No connection. So the last test is just to check each coil to the other coils and make sure nothing is cross-connected and if it is, then that means we have an insulation failure. So excitation winding to leg one, we're fine. To leg two, we're fine. Let's check leg one to leg two. And that is the issue. The insulation failed between leg one and leg two. We're at 1.2 ohms. So that unfortunately means this stator is bad and we're gonna have a part three. Well, whoever said fixing generators was easy. I mean, this one, I was in a bit of disbelief in the first video I made on this when I got the engine running, engine sounded good, power head seemed good. So I couldn't quite figure out why someone would throw this away, but now I do. The power head is, in fact, bad, but that's okay. You know, we spent most of the first video fixing that engine. That engine will be used again, and this video was mostly focused on getting this control panel squared away. So both of those will be reused, but we do need a new stator, and I do have a couple extra. One of them I think will be a good fit, so we'll pick up on this probably in a week or so. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.